brought to you by Apex. Our last panel of the day is called The Pipeline. Um, this panel highlights building a movement for women of color to run, the power of allyship, and leveraging successful, successful partnerships. We have four exciting panelists here today to speak about the work their organizations are doing, to share about their personal experiences, and for us to learn how we can bring our collective power together to build this larger movement for women to lead. It is my pleasure to introduce our moderator for this discussion today, um, Grisela Martinez. Grisela is the Vice President of Government Relations at the National Association of Broadcasters. She has had a distinguished career both on and off Capitol Hill. Um, Grisela is passionate about building a diverse political pipeline and she also serves as a current APAC's board member. Um, so welcome Grisela and I will pass it along to you. Great, thank you so much, Nisha. And similar to you, I'm gonna keep all of our introductions very <laughs> short today. Uh, I'm super excited to be here to be part of this panel. Uh, and I know there's a lot of things that we wanna cover. So um, hopefully we're just gonna jump right in. Uh, if you haven't already, for those watching, read the full bios for these panelists, I encourage you to do so because the breadth and the experience um, that they're bringing to the table for this conversation is really incredible. And uh, this is basically a panel of, I would call showrunners. If you're familiar with that term from television, women that are making, you know, making it happen, they're running the show. And so please check out their full bios um, on the APAC's website or on their respective websites. Um, so four, we've got four folks today. Uh, and I think Glinda is gonna be joining us a little bit later. So you will see her pop in. Uh, Glinda Carr, co-founder of Higher Heights for America and Higher Heights Leadership Fund. Glinda is a political strategist um, who works for, uh, co-founded both these organizations and is one, which are the leading national organizations dedicated to building black women's collective political power from the voting booth to the elected office and a self-described political home for black women and their allies. I love that description. Uh, we're also joined today by Stephanie Lopez, with Latinas Represent. Stephanie is the program manager at Latinas Represent, an initiative of the National Hispanic Leadership Agenda, uh, which focuses on increasing Latina civic engagement and political representation, including raising up models of success. So something that's so important, we're gonna talk about having those blueprints, how to share those models of success with others today. We are also joined by Prairie Rose Seminole with Advanced Native Political Leadership. Prairie Rose is a citizen of the three affiliated tribes of North Dakota, descendant of the Sanish, Arikara, Northern Cheyenne, and Lakota Nations. She has been involved in North Dakota state politics and has served in appointed public office for over 20 years. And in her current role works to secure a reflective democracy for all Americans, one in which the country benefits from the leadership and talents of Native peoples and is responsive to the assets and issues of Native citizens. And I think really that idea of, you know, um, of women of color as assets to democracy, to politics, to the pipeline, big part of, of what we're gonna be diving into. And finally, last but not least, uh, Madeline Chuan Trang Mielke, uh, APAC's president and CEO. Um, and founder and principal of the Aram Group. She brings nearly 25 years of experience working in political campaigns and specializing in political and nonprofit fundraising and political training. Um, I can 100% attest from my perch on the Apex board to how that experience has come to bear um, in her current role and all the things she's accomplished since, since joining Apex. So, Thank you everybody for joining us today. It's so great to see everyone. And actually, Glinda, I know I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna throw a question to all the panelists, but I'm gonna throw it to you first. <laughs> so, um, so you can kind of uh, give us a sense, you know, obviously we're talking here today about building a movement for women of color to run, allyship, leveraging successful partnerships. But right now in the big picture of, of, of what all of these things, you know, what are, the, what are the biggest issues, the biggest barriers right now um, that you're seeing in your respective communities' political pipeline? Um, and, and what kind of is preventing more women of color from becoming politically engaged in that process? And this is for everyone, but Glenda would love to hear from you first. Great, thanks. Um, and thanks for having um, 
having us and I so look forward to this this conversation. So at the end of the day, women of color have been leading, right? We, we are the defenders of our homes, our communities and our democracy. Um, and we see a continued increase in our um, political um, participation as uh, as candidates, but we have been um, you know, particularly black women, the building blocks to a winning coalition as voters. And at the end of the day, um, in 2020, black women, um, and I would expand that to um, women of color, we're demanding our return on our voting invest investment. And that's in the form of policies that directly impact um, our families, our communities, and our nation. And we're claiming seats at decision-making tables. Um, and, you know, although we celebrate the gains we've made um, over the last um, couple of election cycles, at the end of the day, women of color and Black women are still severely underrepresented and underserved in um, our country. Um, and when, as it relates to women of color, and I'll point to data points for black women, um, the what I call man-made barriers and institutional obstacles that are placed in our way um, as candidates are a variety of reasons. Um, one, um, our research with the Center for American Women in Politics points to that women are not actively encouraged to run for office. Women of color are, are um, actively discouraged from running for office. Um, we have um, fundraising, it continues to be a barrier for women um, and women of color. Um, and I would point to two things. Oftentimes, you know, um, candidates of color come from communities where resources are tight, right? And um, budgets are, are fixed and um, our, our communities do give, we don't give at the levels as like these national donors. But one of the things I've been saying to particularly like institutional individual like donors is that it is also, they don't give to candidates of color early. Um, they have to, you know, prove that they're viable. Um, and so the biggest barrier for me right now is this conversation around electability and likability for women of color and black women. Um, because at the end of the day, I'll use the five black women who are currently um, the freshmen in Congress, they all were under-resourced. They didn't have early support from um, institutions and um, donors. But now, everybody, revisionist history. Everybody's like, "Yes, look at those women of color, <laughs> you know, rocking in, con in Congress." And I, and I'm sure my colleagues are like, mm -hmm, "I remember y'all weren't with, mm -mm, no, no." But it was once they realized, and ha most of the time it was after a primary, um, that these women who ran campaign, amazing campaigns with less less money than their counterparts were able to build operations. I do believe that's the tradition we come from. It's just because we do know how to take a dollar and stretch it doesn't mean that's what we need to do for candidates. So I think it is um, continuing to shape the narrative around um, that black women and women of color have always been electable. It has been the narrative that has been built around us about our viability. And as you're aware, many of the women that um, were elected in 2018 and many of the women of color who are running um, in 2020, we are actually running in districts that aren't, that don't actually look like the candidates, right? Which shows that America is ready um, to embrace the leadership of women of color and black women. Um, and so we're running in, in districts that historically you didn't see people of color running. And not only are we running, we're winning, and we are serving that very diverse constituency. And in some cases, like a Lauren Underwood, who represents a district that's only 3% black, are actually representing majority white districts. Yeah, I mean, so so much in there that I wanna <laughs> I wanna talk about, but uh, definitely wanna kick the same question over to either Stephanie or Prairie Rose, whoever wants to kind of go first. Um, just so so much there. <laughs> I'm happy to jump in, and uh, I echo everything that Glenda said. Obviously, all of those are issues within the Latino community, and I just want to add a couple more so that we're not continuing to just touch on you know fundraising and electability and um, the lack of recruitment that exists within the women of color spaces. I also want to talk about specifically for the Latino community, the fact that um, a lot of times people want to pigeonhole the community and say, well, it's a monolith, right? Everyone that's a Latino looks like Shakira or looks like JLo, when that is not the case, right? We are a very diverse community. We have Afro-Latinos, we have Latinos of indigenous backgrounds, we have Latinos that come from various different places. Even just looking at Peru, for example, you have huge migration from China and you have these 
really diverse communities and all of those people then immigrate to the United States. So we have these, this very rich culture that then becomes this monolithic idea within the concept of, of voting, right? And a lot of people try to also tell our Latina candidates, well, you only care about immigration. And that's not something that I care about when in reality, our issues are the issues of the people, right? It's healthcare, it's about women's rights, it's about a variety of different things. So one of the biggest barriers is that pigeonholing that happens to Latina candidates and also the lack of acceptance of the diversity that exists within our community. I think another big issue for us is also the dismal uh, rate of representation for Latinas. Latinos as a whole make up 18% of the U.S. population. So if we say, you know, 50% of that is Latinas, we're 9%, which is about 30 million people. That's a lot of people to me. Um, and yet Latinos of all genders only make up 1.2% of all elected offices at the local, state, and federal level. So a lot of Latinas growing up don't have a lot of examples to look up to. We have only had 19 Latinas serve in Congress. 14 of them are in Congress today. So when I talk to Latinas, a lot of them say, well, I don't see anyone that looks like me. I don't see this as a viable professional alternative for me, you know, even though that is something that they want to pursue and they want to represent their communities because they know the issues that their communities face. And then in addition to that, I think that ties really closely to the idea of not feeling qualified enough. When you're not seeing yourself represented, you don't feel qualified. And we know the research shows that when men look at a job posting, they say, yeah, I can do that even if they only meet 50% of the requirements. But I'm sure that as women, a lot of us on this call have been guilty of looking at all the requirements and saying, I need to meet every single one of these to make sure that I can apply for it. And the same thing happens when people are thinking about running for office. So our biggest thing is always telling women, you are qualified, you are worthy, your voice matters, you need to run. And then one last point is the balancing of responsibilities within the Latino community. Again, it is very diverse, but one of the big things that happens is that uh, Latinos take care of their elders. And um, that is also a big thing that people have to factor in, whether they have children, whether they have to take care of other elders, different community members. And that is something that they're always thinking about, especially when it comes to fundraising, when it comes to being out campaigning and knowing that they have uh, to be caregivers for people in their community. So I, I just want to add those points to what Glenda already said. No, that's great. Thank you. Um, Prairie Rose would love to hear from you on this as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I, I agree with what the previous, what Glenda and um, Stephanie have already said as well. It relates very much with the American Indian, Alaska Native, and the indigenous population here in the United States, where the what stephanie brought up that that concept of self-viability uh for indigenous people here how do you become engaged in a system or a process within a system when you've been intentionally left out of it right you've been a, a part of a system that's not designed for you so that self-viability piece is is one that resonates um very much with me as an organizer because I have to deal with well why should I get involved that apathy of like well why should I even run for office right so we have to talk about this system and the intention behind that system designed to leave us out and keep our voices squelched right like we we've been silenced and once people know their rights and know that they can make a difference and they've seen that our vote matters when other candidates are, are getting elected. I mean, our votes have made the difference across the country, North Dakota, Montana, you know, Arizona, Nevada. I mean, all of these states that have counted on the native vote to, to push their candidates forward. Um, you know, how engaged are those now elected leaders still continue to be involved with our communities? Oftentimes for indigenous communities, they're not very much engaged afterwards. And so they may not get reelected and that's the threat um that we have as a as a population like you should know our vote does matter because we got you elected um now running for office again taking that next step to changing that system i put my hopeful reformist hat on and say yeah if we can get all the 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 people in the seats you know the half a million seats of elected office in this country uh held by women and held by women of color 
um, and indigenous women, like we can absolutely make a difference and change the system for the better. Because our households um, in my community, we grow up very much engaged with family and kinship and community, not so much citizenship, right? To this greater governance structure that we're a part of. And it's very different from my non-native counterparts who, who grow up in a system um, you know, my, my nieces and nephews outside of our, our tribal school systems are learning about citizenship in a very different way um, and connecting to it in almost a, 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 that American exceptionalist uh, mentality that, you know, we are the best. Um, are we, right? But uh, challenging uh, Indigenous voters to get involved in the system and then to run for office, um, you know, we're, we're dealing with very unique barriers to our community. Um, including, um, you know, not having physical addresses and polling locations not being existent, right? Um, it's hard for, for our rural communities, which is about 60% of our population in the United States, to, to get to vote. I mean, here on my reservation, I'm calling in from Western North Dakota. I mean, we have polling locations that are an hour and a half drive away one way to vote, right? So if you're told when you get there that they challenge your ID or if they challenge your, your address and you're told to go to another polling location, you're kind of defeated. And so some folks just don't vote that day. And that's problematic. Um, we're looking at the vote by mail system. Um, but in, in some states, it's taken a good 10 years to, to establish a good vote by mail system. Uh, we're looking at that for the 2020 election cycle right now. How are we establishing trust in a system again when we're looking at the closure of post offices across the United States and rural communities um, to a population that's that's systemically been left left out of that that process in general it's 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 like climbing that uphill battles of one um, hoop after another jumping that we have to get people engaged and involved with so it's a challenge but we're we're hopeful we see folks like Deb Holland and Sharice Davis and and others winning their elections um and, and engaging uh the the larger communities and not just on native issues right because what is good for us is good for everybody just as Stephanie has said the, our issues are housing and food and um you know, community issues that, that we all face. When we do better, we all do better. So I'll check there. Yeah. Madeline, you want to round us off here? Absolutely. And, you know, I, I'm thankful every day that I get to work here um, at Apex to be able to uh, spend time with uh, Glenda and Stephanie and her colleagues at Latinas Represent and at Higher Heights because uh, we have a uh, a coalition that works towards that and Prairie Rose, I look forward to finding ways that we can collaborate uh, because this is really about making sure that we build coalitions to encourage and support and uplift one another as women of color, uh, specifically towards the API women's community. Uh, a stereotype that, uh, a negative one at that is, you know, when we think about leadership and the community itself um, being a, um, some ones that they don't see as leaders. And I think that's um, a stereotype that uh, we need to overcome. Um, the API community also has this perpetual foreigner stereotype that being constantly asked, where are you really from? And um, I think this is part of the barriers that are placed upon us as people who wanna run as candidates. And you know, it is psychological um, and it can be demoralizing. And so when we think about the definition of leadership, it's not, not just the words that matter, it's also that visualization. It's also visualizing that it doesn't default to a white male and that this ability of all of us to encourage one another to say, why not have leaders who look like any of us in any constituency, you know, in any district because of the fact that uh, we have the experience and we have uh, all of the you know, commitment towards creating public policy that will benefit all communities. So I think all of these things are a part of um, recognizing our vulnerabilities, understanding how we can help each other and uplifting all the positive aspects of our individual constituencies. Um, it was wonderful to see in elections um, last year, in the off-year elections, to see 
candidates of color supporting one another, even sharing office space together, you know, in, in the Boston City Council elections that happened. And I, I applaud all of those things because it means that we're looking out for one another. And I think that's part of the sisterhood of, of being, you know, a woman and running for office because we know that there are barriers and challenges that affect us specifically because we are women. And I think uh, the more we can spend time helping each other, understanding one another, uh, we will be better for it. Yeah, no, 100%. And that's a great segue to kind of a few things that I think I've heard all of you say about this idea of self viability, right? Or why, why do we always kind of focus so much? And am I ready? Am I trained enough? Is there, you know, am I, am I ready for this? I'm a, I'm a viable candidate instead of kind of, you know, I think focusing on going on that. And I think there's a lot to that culturally, but, but also Madeline, when you talked a little bit, um, you know, I, I view this, I, this idea of viability also tied in allyship and kind of the idea that, what do we do for each other as allies and how do we kind of create what i what i've i think others have called the echo effect right that when there is a, a viable candidate somebody that's out there that what are we doing as allies how are we kind of creating an echo effect so that other people see somebody um, as viable and so to me that really goes to kind of that question of um you know what are we know kind of what some of those barriers are, but can we talk a little bit about how do we define allyship with other women of color and what can we do to be better allies to each other? Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I will say Judy Chu spoke in her opening remarks about her own story and challenges that she specifically faced in kind of running for office and being blocked by the old boys network and that it was her allyship with another API woman who had faced similar challenges that helped her kind of overcome those challenges. And so I would love to hear from from all of you about that idea of allyship and what are what is your what are you doing what are your organizations doing to really bring out um, that allyship both either within your respective communities like the you know it's like you were saying Stephanie not just a monolithic Latino community um, also similar I know with uh, Native Americans also not a monolithic community um, Asians as well so it's like I would love to hear from some of some of you Stephanie do you want to address that Sure, and thank you for the question about allyship. Obviously, allyship is incredibly important, and I think sometimes it gets lost in this idea of you know being woke and just um, people calling themselves an ally. When I think in reality, you have to be called an ally by the community that you are a true ally with. And for me, allyship is defined as a, a lifelong process of building a consistent and trusting relationship with communities that are different from your own. And I think the key there is the consistency and making sure that there is trust because it is very difficult for different people and different communities to open up to someone who is not going through the same experiences that they are going through, right? And so I think that when you're being an ally, you have to be open to accepting critique, to accepting that sometimes you might be wrong, that you need to learn and grow and you have to be consistent in that process. It's not like you're just gonna get to a point and you're like, well, I'm an ally, I'm done with my job here. That's not how it works. Um, and just continuing to be an advocate for the equal treatment of communities, regardless of what community that is, right? You can't just say, I'm an ally for one, this specific community, but forget about all others because we are all in this together and we need to continue the fight together um, and so that's the most important part of allyship and i think that as uh, madeline said you know it was really great to see women of color last election season coming together sharing space become being allies with one another and it's also really great to see that even if a woman of color loses her primary race, but there is another woman of color running, that they throw their support behind that person, right? That there isn't this, oh, well, this is my community, I'm going to keep them. No, you have to continue to support one another because we know that our missions are aligned and that we want to move forward to create equality for everyone. Any thoughts on that that you wanna share, Prairie Rose? Yeah, just briefly. I mean, systems change work is, isn't an individual sport. It's a team sport, right? We can support one another. And so we need allies to bring us into those spaces and, and to, to help um, be alongside us doing the work of that systems change, especially from, you know, as an organizer working within the dominant culture of systems, like 
allies have, have made all the difference in getting us into these spaces. And then once we're in those spaces, you know, scaling our voices and um, the work, like getting to mass, it really makes a meaningful policy happen or, or decision happen. Um, it's, it's, it's based on trust and you can only do that at the speed of trust, right? As Stephanie said, like it's, 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 it takes time. And, and for some people that's, that's work, you know, there's this dominant culture approach of like, all right, here's our budget, here's our goal date, like this is going to happen within this particular timeline. It doesn't always happen that way, right? And so that's why I think we've seen a deficiency in, in trusting the systems that we're a part of as, as an indigenous community. I can't speak for all of us, but, but just seeing and being in the, in that change work model, how um, <laughs> candidates have, um, you know, failed us on so many levels, right? And <laughs> we need our allies to show up and, and just be better folks. So um, I'll check there. No, no, that, that, that makes sense. And I think you, you know, kind of, Glenda touched on this in, in her opening kind of thoughts. And I think you both, Stephanie, both you and Prairie Rose just, you know, uh, talked about this idea of, you know, like the, what kind of systematic change is, is needed, what kind of systematic change is necessary. You know, I think uh, Glenda called it man-made barriers. Like some of those things are, you know, um, really discouraging to women getting into the pipeline, getting into candidacy. Um, some of those things that you just mentioned, Prairie Rose, about kind of, you know, well, this is like the model and how do we work within that. Can you, can, can you talk a little bit, and it's, I'll s start with uh, Glenda now that you've rejoined us. Um, can you talk a little bit about how your organization is addressing some of those systematic um, barriers, like some of those man-made barriers that you referred to uh, in terms of the, the pipelining and getting folks um, into office? Sure. I mean, we... Um... Higher Heights was born in a Brooklyn cafe in uh, 2011, right after um, a midterm election that some thought was like the end, you know, like if you were, if you're a left-leaning person, you're like, what happened with 2010? And then you woke up to 2016 and was like, what is this? Um, and so the Higher Heights was born out of just having coffee with a good friend, Kimberly Peeler Allen and I, complaining about being in rooms, we'd worked in politics most of our lives, being in rooms and literally starting to do the caucus, um, the caucus of color, <laughs> because the room had four people of color, uh, and said, how do we actually, and, and then hearing from our white counterparts going, oh, are, are there more of you? Like, there's not more of us, right? <laughs> Um, and it's like, yeah. Um, and so for us, we were like, we want to uniquely design a space formed by Black women. So even just the notion of creating a space that's unapologetically for and by Black women, step one. Step two, um, as y'all are aware, oftentimes research um, by the broader body goes white women and women of color, <laughs> right? And, and, and the notion of like, you know, breaking up are, you know, it is collectively together, and I think it is important for us to talk about our collective story and our numbers as women of color, but actually being able to like then really narrow in on, you know, um, particular race and ethnicities also allows you to then um, create um, a blueprint um, around elected um, leadership. So we, you know, we believe that one of our pillars is around research, right? So you can't build a pathway forward if you don't know where you've been and where you are, uh, and being able to um, then determine what is the strategy to actually to invest in Black women's political leadership. Um, second, we think, um, and I, I put this as a third, is that at the end of the day, our work is culture shift work. Can we create the environment for Black women to vote run, win, and lead. And that environment, frankly, is creating the environment for Black women to believe that they can, 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 can um, step into and lead in this moment. Um, and then also creating the broader, um, broader um, community recognizing the importance of our leadership. Um, you put that all together, we already know Black women lead, right? <laughs> um, and so then it is about creating a network um, um, that will support Black women when they decided to, to step off the sidelines and boldly lead and run for office. So that is organizing Black women and allies to open up their pocketbooks and their wallets to support Black women running for office. It is about um, it, knowing the importance of um, volunteering for candidates that inspire you. And so we then set out and um, created 
um, trainings uniquely designed for and by black women. Um, one of the unique pieces um, that we do is we leaned in actually on online training. Um, according to Nielsen, black women actually spend more time on um, social media than the general population. We click through more videos than the general population. And, and, and one of the barriers that we um, um, uh, discovered with our research with the Center for American Women in Politics, as I mentioned, is that Black women are actually actively discouraged. So creating safe spaces for them to explore the possibility of running for office and getting the, the information they need in the privacy of their homes or, you know, in a community library, we found as a space, something that was unique that we brought to the ecosystem. This year, we launched a nine-month um, fellowship program. So deeply investing in, so we do broad work, which is our online training, um, giving Black women the tools, and frankly, just being like, you can do this, right? And then our depth of work is investing in 25 Black civic leaders, right? And, and these leaders will end up running, not, not only potentially running for office or being positioned for appointed office. Um, the goal of these senior civic leaders is that um, we don't all have to run for office, right? We can um, be, we can start our own organizations. We can be um, leaders of existing organizations and frankly, um, executives in national led organizations. Um, and then finally, they, we can be policy, we, we can help sh shape policy as thought leaders. Um, and so that's our approach is, you know, it's a four prong, know the information you need to know to be able to create a multi-year, multi-million dollar investment in political leadership, help create the environment recruit, train, and support Black women running for office, and then giving our elected leaders spaces for them to, um, uh, giving space for our elected leaders to govern boldly. Um, and that's by, you know, ensuring that um, citizens um, continue to participate beyond the election booth um, and help um, these um, amazing uh, leaders govern very boldly. No, uh, that's, yeah, I mean, that is a lot. <laughs> you are doing a lot. Uh, I don't know if anybody else wants to to weigh in quickly on that. I mean, I think that there's a lot, there's a lot there. Um, one thing I think that you mentioned that I've, I've, everyone else, again, has also said so far is, you know, this idea of, of, of active discouragement and how are, what your organizations are doing, how is, you know, battling some of the systematic, um, you know, barriers that need to change. Like, how are we changing those things to, to encourage instead of actively discourage people. We talked a little bit about allyship and how allyship can help in that. But I'm also curious to hear um, to hear from folks about, and especially, and Stephanie, I'd like to actually start with you about this idea of, you know, yes, allyship, but also to partnerships, right? And so formal partnerships. I know Latinas represents as part of the uh, initiative by the National Hispanic Leadership Agenda, you know, that's an association group of a lot of major Latino national organizations. So a lot of different allies, a lot of different partnerships, you know, how, how do you leverage those partnerships successfully, right? And what would you, what kind of advice would you give to folks out there who are looking to do more of that? Yeah, thank you. So first of all, I think it's important to note that partnerships are about relationships and about forming, trusting, consistent relationships with people. And as you mentioned, Latinas Represent is uniquely positioned because we are an initiative of a coalition of about 40 different national Latino-led organizations that focus on everything from environmental policy to housing to LGBTQ rights, et cetera, right? So we run the gamut. So we have that space where we are very lucky to be able to tap into different resources, to tap into different reports that are being put out, and to build relationships across this large coalition. Um, the way that we have leveraged these partnerships is really being able to connect especially with organizations within our coalition and we are also part of reflect us which with apex and higher heights it's great to be part of that coalition as well but to work with partners whether it is in trainings or to put together um, different types of information that can go out to our readers and to our subscribers, right? And for Latinas Represents, one of the big things is making sure that we are putting out stories of Latinas. Like I said, you know, not seeing yourself in politics causes you to not feel like you are a viable candidate. And the other thing is that not all Latinas want to run for office. They want to be political strategists. They want to be staffers. They want to be chiefs of staff. And we think that it's incredibly important to start building that pipeline because we have also seen 
really great cases of success where someone has been a chief of staff for X number of years and then says, hey, I think I could be the person that's in front of the camera as opposed to behind it and I want to run for office now. So it's very important to also to tap into that energy because a lot of people are shy and a lot of people don't really know, you know, what way they can best uh, represent their communities and they think that they can do it as staffers and we want to continue to promote that. So sharing those stories as well and talking to people about the uh, experiences that are, are available, the opportunities that are available out there for them. So it's really about informing and connecting with different uh, coalition members and for us specifically, we also have people reaching out to us via social media constantly saying, I'm part of this organization, we really want to connect, we see the work that you're doing, you know, how can we connect on this specific topic? And that that's something that we continue to build and those are also really great relationships and we love reading uh, when people come into our DMs and tell us that our work is having a positive impact in, in their lives. So I think it's about partnerships with greater coalitions, with the greater um, organizations, but also with the everyday people who are reaching out to you, because even though they might not have an organization backing them up, they are important and their stories matter. And you want to make sure that you're cultivating that thing that tells them your voice matters and thank you for reaching out to me and we got your back. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. And um, I want to, you know, we've got a, a question from, from the audience that I think actually speaks to some of what you just talked about, Stephanie. And so um, would love to hear from, from, from any of you about this. And you talked about visibility, right? And so this question from the audience is that one thing I've noticed is that civic engagement work tends to always leave out a certain portion of our community. Um, how can we make sure that everyone in our community is involved and included? And as an example, they talked about, you know, um, we can use digital media and emails for updates, but not everybody in the community may have internet, right? Not everybody in the community may have uh, device access. You know, there's like a lot of different things that go into how do you create that visibility and how do you include folks that may not have access to some of these things? So would love to hear from, from any of you about this. I can respond. Um, and, and just to, to respond to you with what um, Stephanie just uh, was talking about too with the allyship and I mean our networks to collectively like some some of us are just waiting to be told like hey um, this is our issue we need your support on this this is how you you can show up for us right um, and then we show up how we're asked uh, when we're asked and so some of us just have to start asking because our networks have collective reach that um, can be hugely impactful when it comes to the issues that our communities face and if we're not engaging people are not making asks um, and clear asks and direct asks uh, we might not get that support and um, I see that you know with some of these national movements that you know we can we can act alongside each other without coordination um, and so the end goals vary from community to community to state to state when we're where our end goal is really the, the same and if it's systems change for, for our case like what are our asks around that and I think our our flavor of that systems change has primarily been politics and um, you know the voice of politics isn't necessarily that that sexy sometimes you know sometimes it can be long text heavy narrative around potential policy and um, you not all of us read that way and getting to the, the the viewers question about how do we reach people who may not be engaged well not everybody's going to read a long narrative around a certain policy on how that's going to affect our lives but they might respond to um, you know somebody knocking on their door and asking for support in, in meaningful ways um, in, rural, in our rural communities and rural organizing that I've been involved with for such a I mean most of my life um, it, it, there's so many layers to it, right? You, there's we we know kind of that 20% of people who are like with us at all times and going to do, you know, whatever diehard ask we ask for, um, because they've been a part of the change and they believe in that change to just stick with it for the long term. Um, but you're right. There's going to be folks who are not social media savvy who. Who are not engaged, and that's just the old-fashioned face-to-face stuff. Now in pandemic times, that's changing for sure. But but we're still reaching out to people in phone calls. We're just getting back to good old phone calls again, and that's that's making a difference. And we're asking people, you know, to 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 share phone numbers of people who they think might need a call from us. And 
uh, it, it's, it's making the difference. Um, and sometimes we're getting on the calls and not talking at all about the issue that we're trying to enact change on, but people, people want to want to listen and people want to have a conversation. So, um, it's time we make that flavor of pol politics personal and we won't do that without stories and building trust with one another. I would just echo that. I mean, we all come from, um, traditions, um, go, like going back to the traditions that our organizing um, theory has come from. You know, I, we always, you know, I use my mother as an example all the time, you know, so, and then this is pre-COVID, because obviously pre-pre, because -pre, I'm old, er, is that on my 18th birthday, I don't remember what my parents bought me, but I remember she drove me down to register me to vote. Right. Um, and so even during COVID, those are the traditions of what the women in our communities have done. Um, until the day she died, she called me and my brothers, her micro circle, to ensure that our voices was going to be heard on the ballot box. Um, you know, when we were able to have people in, it's about candidates, um, both candidates that look like our communities and though, and frankly, particularly those who don't know, don't come knocking on my door 14 days before you're asking for my vote. Um, you know, the whole notion of, you know, my mother had a candidate knock on our door in her 70s. She had never had like direct contact with a candidate. She invited him in for a cup of tea <laughs> and he stayed for two hours, right? I, and, and, and frankly, he wasn't even, he was knocking on the wrong door because I don't even think he was um, a member of a party she would have voted for. Um, and he stayed in contact with her because it was something about his interaction with this older black woman that was impactful for the very small town she lived in. And that is the work of all the candidates, including the candidate, the women of color, is how do we actually get back to the tradition of uh, talking and inspiring our folk and ensuring that our voices are heard. Um, and, and a lot of those tactics um, don't connect to modern technology. It is remembering we used to do this when we didn't have technology and we were actually very good at it. Oh my gosh, there's so much. I mean, we're we're close. We're going right up against our time slot, and I just I feel like we haven't even scratched the surface of the kinds of things that we could all talk about. This group is amazing. I I want to keep talking to you for several more hours. Uh, I wish we I wish we could do that, but I I will end hopefully I guess with a quick question for all of you um, to just you know let us let let everyone out there know if you could summarize in just like one sentence. What's like the most important thing that you want people to take away from today's kind of discussion? And um, just like one thing that if, if you want people to remember or think about or kind of hold with them as they, they go forward in the rest of the day and listening to the other great panelists that we have here today. And then we'll, we'll close it out because I think that's just important for folks to feel like what is that takeaway today? Um, yeah, so I guess I'll get started just because we're really, really, really short on time. I'll keep it short. And one thing that I, I want to say is just your voice matters. You have influence. You don't have to be this Instagram influencer to be able to touch other people's lives. You are able to touch them through the everyday communication and contact you have with them. So make sure that you continue that type of communication with them and to stay connected with your community. And one thing, especially for people of immigrant backgrounds, you know, we are our grandparents' wildest dream. They never thought that we would be here. So I always think about that as I go through my work and I go through my day, I might be stressed out, but just know that you have power and that's something that maybe generations before you didn't have. So it's time that you exercise that power in whatever way is most inf impactful in your circle and in your community, including voting. <laughs> Oops, Glinda, Prairie Rose. My, my quick thing, I had to look, look, look it up to have it right because I haven't said it in a while. So, you know, my name is Glinda. Uh, my parents say they did not name me after G Glinda, the Good Witch of the North from the Wizard of Oz. But I will leave you with a quote from Glinda, the Good Witch. You've always had the power, my dear. You just had to learn it for yourselves. And I think that is what collectively um, women of color are doing. We are stepping into the power that we always had. Um, and in the spirit of Shirley Chisholm, you know, we need um, women of color now more than ever in this democracy to lead in her tradition of being unbought and embossed. And we know that we, we can do, we do this as voters, as citizens, as advocates, as elected officials, and as candidates. 
yeah, we have some healing to do with this uh, citizenship of this country and, and the generations before me were, were left out and that, that caused a lot of problems, right? And so I know that my generation, um, myself, I'm healed enough to do some of this work and really get into it. Um, but I know that the next generation is healed even more away from the trauma that my, my people has experienced. And, um, and uh, they're, they're going to be able to do so much more. And so my work now, not just getting people involved in the system and, and systems change, but protecting that younger generation. So in, in my generation of those of us who are, who are taking those bold steps and running and leading in, in various ways, but that younger generation, they give me so much hope. And I just want to protect all of that dream that they have and that fire that they have so that they can do what they, they want to do. And so if we can vote and create these spaces for them to thrive, um, I'm down. So we all can do this together and support one another. Amazing. And Madeline, close us out. <laughs> Thank you so much to all of my pan all of the fellow panelists today. Uh, you know, Apex, we're here to inspire, educate, empower, and connect. And this is part of that connection is being able to recognize and learn from our other communities and understand and empathize and walk along with you as we go through this adventure. Uh, whether it's as an activist, an advocate, you know, a elected official and a candidate or someone who just wants to be in part of the process and feel like they have a valued voice. We think all of you are assets because of that. We bring such a richness to this country because of our shared experiences and our lived experiences. And it's so important for us as an organization to lift, uplift, elevate, and really see those marginalized communities and give them that platform to be able to, to use it when we have the opportunity to share those stories. So that's really something I would like our participants and attendees to really feel a part of, not only just this sense of sisterhood within the API community, but also amongst all of yours, because we want to be there with you as we all achieve success in terms of elected representation. So thank you so much. Just again, truly incredible. Thank you all so much for joining us today. I encourage everybody who's watching on Zoom, on Facebook, however you're participating today to check out each of these women's uh, organizations online again like see how you can you can be that ally you can be that partner um, you know we've just got some amazing uh, resources when we all work together and so I just feel really blessed to have been with all of you here today uh, talking about some of these things so everyone else stay tuned for the next set of speakers that we've got um, and thank you for joining us